Thanks, thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah recession-proof stocks. So we all, I suppose, have our opinions about the fate of South Africa, and I suppose it can get quite controversial as well. So with with different differing opinions, like I'm sure I'm going to offend people tonight, and and if you feel offended, like just don't be. I love everyone here yeah, equally. It's not. Um, we, we're not here out to offend, but uh, what we're kind of going to look at is, is you know, we, we're in a recession in South Africa. It is a very difficult environment. Pessimism is at sort of record levels. Um, but yeah, I want, to, I want to kind of explore the concept of investing in a recession. Uh, should we invest in a recession? How does it affect your investments, uh, you know, when, when economies go into recession? Um, you know, what can you do to improve your performance? And, and really, something that comes out of our client base a lot is, uh, is, it, is it even safe to invest in South Africa? At all. Is South Africa a place that, that does not deserve your capital? Should we be just shipping everything into the developed markets or, or other emerging markets and just really running for the hills with whatever we can we can get? So before before I start the presentation, I kind of want to just discuss um, risk and how you measure it and, and what you should think about when, uh, when trying to decide whether you're going to make an investment or not. Now, there's all like risk is an entire subject. I mean, it's a it's a discipline, and there's there's a lot that goes into risk. So, I mean, when you're looking at uh, market returns and, and and portfolio returns and and the the return that you're going to generate on your investment, I mean, there's portf uh, modern portfolio management theory. There's uh, you know you can look at it as a standard deviation. You can look at it as volatility, but I think you know the question that we seem to be getting from our clients at the moment is, is the systemic risk in South Africa. What what are the chances that that everything really falls apart and, and the investments don't just come down in value, but, but that something breaks in the system and that you can no longer access your money. So, you know, we're talking about the, the, the apocalyptic event. And, and I mean, you know, if you look at our uh, our industry, while yes, we, we are very tall asset managers, as, as Simon said, we've also got, on the one side, I've got, I've got Viv Governor, who is probably the most pessimistic person when it comes to South Africa. And you, you can just talk to him, I mean, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. And I mean, he, I, he, I've got him, you know, sort of talking one year. I've got Singh on the other side, who is one of the most optimistic people uh, around South Africa and, and the demographic dividend and, and the ability for South Africa to come right, and, and perhaps with a, a change in, in the executive, with, with a change, uh, you know, is a reduction in corruption, um, you, you know, may, maybe through democratic means, who knows, we could see, you know, a fantastic recovery in, in a lot of our asset prices as investors, but just also in the optimism and, and the hope that, that, that I think South Africa has lost in the last couple of years. Um, but if we look again at systemic risk, like when we're investing, we, you know, in the local context, we're investing in, in the JSE. So the JSE is a self-regulating organization, and it's overseen by the Financial Services Board. Um, you know, this gives you, because it's an exchange, it gives you additional protection uh, outside of the, the traditional, um, you, you know, like OTC instruments. So if you're trading currencies, that kind of thing, it's in an OTC market, even CFDs. Exchange traded, investing in shares on the JSE, it's exchange traded, you have all sorts of additional protection because of that. If you look at, this is the Global Comp uh, Competitive Report Survey uh, for 2016-2017, you can see that... Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, regulation of the securities exchanges, we, we rate number three out of 138 countries in the world. We, we are, and, and that's, okay, that is actually down a little bit, so you can talk about institutional decay if you want to, but seriously, three out of uh, 138 is, is actually fantastic. You know, you look at the soundness of our banks, we come in second in the world for soundness of, the, of our banks. Um, and financing through the local equity market, so, you know, listing, listing on the exchange and, and raising capital, number one. Um, you look at that, you're sitting in the building that is, 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 is a, literally a world-class leader in, in, its, uh, in its field. Now, we can talk about, you know, independence of reserve banks who, I don't know, they're not independent because they're cutting rates today. I, I don't know. Like, the, the fact is that this institution still exists and, and it's a long way away from, from being, you know, disintegrated. And, and, if we, and if we see it, we will see it happening. Now, there are significant regulatory changes coming with Twin Peaks. The way that the exchange is going to be regulated is going to change as well. But I think from, from an investor's point of view, you can take, uh, um, I suppose, comfort in the fact that we're going to see these things coming. It's not going to happen overnight that your, your, your funds are suddenly seized. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly through. This is actually the derivatives market um, risk model. Uh, and it, it, it basically, so, so when you kind of come to us as, as Rand Swiss and you invest and you want to buy stocks, what, what, what the first level of protection you ha have is that we are regulated by the, the, the financial services board. So whenever you, you're investing, go and, you know, if you're investing in someone whose regulation is out of Cyprus and they don't have a number, 
you're probably going to get into trouble, you know, if they regulate it out of some Tongan island. And we've had this with clients where they've come to us and said, I've got all this money sitting in this company, which I don't really know where they are located and, and what's happening. Yeah, don't do that. It's not a good idea. Know, know where you're investing. And, and, and really, I mean, you can go on the FSB's website. You can check financial services providers. You can check the categories they're listed in. Because of that, we are rated as a financial institution. That means that all the funds that you put with a financial institution are separate from a business. They, 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 they can't be classed as part of the balance sheet. It's not like a bank. And, um, and, and they have to be held in trust. Uh, again, we've got all sorts of uh, hurdles that you have to, you know, when you become a, a member of the exchange or when you become a financial service provider, you have to meet capital adequacy requirements, you have to meet balance sheet requirements, you have to have insurance requirements. There's all sorts of things that go on. Once you, you sort of uh, approach the, the, the JSC structure, the member firms all also contribute to the JSC Guarantee Fund, um, depending if what instrument you're trading, there are other funds as well, so the derivatives are slightly different, uh, BC is slightly different again. But essentially, like, this, like I said, this is the, the derivative model. If a client goes bankrupt, so for some reason he defaults and owes the member money, and the member can't pay, the member will go bankrupt, but the clearing member is then responsible. The clearing member, which is the likes of ABSA, Investec, these are huge institutions, if they go bankrupt, and because they, they now stand surety for all the other clients' funds underneath, it then goes up to the JSE. On top of the JSE, okay, so in the derivatives markets, you've got JSE Clear. You've also got the JSE Guarantee Fund, which all members contribute to. This will stand ready to basically solve any problems. It's, it's a, an incredibly robust uh, risk system that, that we have in South Africa. But at the same time, You've got to remember, okay, so for us, we are a financial services provider. We've made that choice um, instead of going the membership route because we want to be able to offer access to multiple markets. You know, it's wonderful to trade on a, a, an institution like the JSE, but we also want to be able to offer clients NASDAQ and yeah, New York Stock Exchange and London Stock Exchange, et cetera. So we want to be able to offer different markets, so that's why we go that route. But the thing that you can do is you also just have to know who you're dealing with. I mean, try and deal with someone face-to-face. -face. Uh, the financial mail rated us uh, in the stock, top stockbroker survey last year, the most transparent and responsive broker in South Africa. So, you know, you should, I suppose, do your research on, on, on who you're investing with as well. Okay, now we can get back to power. Huh? Now that you understand that it is safe to invest in South Africa from a systemic point of view. So, what is a recession? We, we all hear that we're in a technical recession. People are like, what is a tech, are we technically in a recession? Is, it, is, it, is, is a technical recession different from a normal recession? No. Like, a recession is just... A recession is a general slowdown in economic activity, and technically it is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Now, that's, that's just saying that it is a re officially a recession, but um, really it, it, it's the fact that uh, we're not perhaps growing like we should be, unemployment are, is at the wrong levels, and all the economic metrics that we use to measure the economy are not where they should be. That, for me, is a recession. Um, although, yes, defining a recession, we, we are technically in a recession because we, these are the last two quarters that we had, and that puts us in a recession. As you can see, over the last couple of years, last time we were in a recession was three quarters of recession um, just post-2008 financial crisis. That's when the whole world was melting down and everyone really thought it was the end, and we can go back to the nuclear explosion if you want. But... Um, and you look before that, I mean, all the way back to 1994, we've actually had fairly robust growth. That's probably to do with uh, the rise in commodity prices and the commodity boom that we've had. But the fact is that while we, we are now technically in a recession, we have actually been, you know, fairly lackluster performance for the last couple of years in South Africa. Our markets have gone sideways, but, but maybe markets are not the right way to approach this. Like, yeah, from, a, from a fundamental economic point of view, we haven't grown as we should. If we look at the numbers, and I don't, yeah, I've been asked not to depress everyone tonight, but um, if you look at 2008, you know, our unemployment situation, we, we are the bars, has steadily, steadily been increasing. We, we, were, we had reversed, but we're still talking with the left axis here. I mean, from 30% unemployment, this is, it's, it's ridiculous like where we, where we stand. And I mean, you know, most people would look at that and say, but Gary, it's probably a worse situation. That official number is incorrect anyway. We're working with the official numbers because that's what we have to work with. We can see that the, the rest of the world also went through a period in 2008 where unemployment spiked. So these are the US numbers. Um, US unemployment up to 10% and then slowly 
a reduction as the QE programs, as the right policies were put in place. We saw an unwinding of that very quickly. Okay, so this is the same thing. The, the light line is uh, South Africa. This is the UK unemployment. You can see UK unemployment a lagged a little bit. So from the recession in 2008, um, they, they, it took them a, a good few years to, to, to get right. Um, that was, you know, and if you, like, this is then the, the uh, sorry, that was uh, EU, this is the UK. Um, so if you look at the EU as well, so only from about 2013, and part of the reason for that was, you know, the EU went in with a, you know, more a structural program. They tried to change uh, from a fiscal point of view, so they were, they were trying to shift their economy, whereas the Americans just came in and printed money with Ben Bernanke and said, you know, go wild, we, we're going to reinflate uh, the economy. Um, and you saw the, the, the US economy turning a lot quicker than the, the, the European economies. Um, you look at the Chinese economy, so I wanted to put it in at least one emerging market. Now, we can't really trust Chinese data. There's a lot of uh, question marks around Chinese data. and I don't know, I, I question that because it's like the dots are all funny. But even then, we can kind of see that uh, you know, the official numbers from China are that the unemployment situation is getting better there as well. So we are diverging from the rest of the world, which is unfortunate. Look at inflation. Now, inflation is the one thing in South Africa that is an incredibly positive thing. So, you know, if we look at the Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank, I mean, with the Public Protector's uh, report recently, it has been called into question, you, you know, whether, you know, all sorts of things. I don't want to get too much into that. But uh, essentially, as it stands, our, our Reserve Bank is independent and, 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 a, and, a, and a very strong institution. We can see that by the results that it's delivered. Our inflation has been within target band for, for most of the, uh, the, the last, let's say, seven years. Um, you know, our growth rate has suffered, but perhaps on the back of that. And uh, yeah, so I've just overlaid the, the little dotted line is our interest rate cycle. So we've seen, we've actually been hiking interest rates into this part of this is because of the policy issues that we've had. Um, but yeah, we actually, actually you, know, this, you can see I did this before today, and today we had a 25 basis point cut. So it's just come down a little bit. And now that's, that for me is very positive because we do have a little bit of room to maneuver here. We're not in a stagflation environment in South Africa. Our inflation is well within its target band, in spite of you know, a currency that's blown out and, and a lot of imported inflation, in spite of droughts, in spite of a lot of negative things, we've managed to, we've managed to protect the value essentially of, uh, or at least we, we've managed to keep the, the general price level stable, which is, which is very positive for doing business in South Africa. Now this is where things start to really fall apart when you start to look at the government debt to GDP and you can just see post-2008 the, the trend is very, very clear what's happening there. And that, this, is, this is kind of a, a big worry. What, how is that translating? And I, you know, I'm trying to tell a, a story in numbers here, but um, how is that translating to business confidence? We're at the worst levels of business confidence since 2008. There's been an absolute implosion of investor confidence around South Af in, in South Africa. Now that in itself can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you can see this is a very volatile number as it goes. So it doesn't take much for, for business confidence to reverse. It can be the change of a president that can they suddenly change investors' attitude towards our country, and things will change automatically. So the difference between, for me, so, so the, the investor confidence is really what gets, gets to the heart of, um, of investing for me. So the difference between you know, investor confidence is, is that picture and that picture. So that picture is when you're confident that, that an economy is going to grow, that you're going to be able to let out buildings, that you're willing to put capital to work there, and your property, is gonna, your property rights are going to be protected. You will build fantastic buildings in Sampton. You, you, will, you will foot for that. When you have no investor confidence, you don't even want to maintain buildings. You don't want to do anything. You want money out of the country at all points because you're afraid that, that your investment is not going to think. And like I said, I'll put a bipolar smiley face there for you guys as well because that's, that's how, invest, how quickly investor sentiment can change. It's, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a very fickle thing. And it's something that I suppose as investors you need to be aware of, that you need to try and look at the numbers and the, the actual, you know, the, the individual investment cases rather than being, allowing that the, the, the general, I suppose, media pessimism to, to you know, pervade your thoughts. Um, and try and, yeah, try and keep, uh, you know, a little bit more optimistic, but uh, at the same time just, just try and work with the numbers that you've got as well. Um, and that's where I'm going to go th five things to consider when investing in a recession. So the first thing is, uh, and this is, I suppose, the, the obvious one, is that a recession isn't everywhere. You don't have to invest in a recession. You don't have to look at a, con a country that's got slack growth rates and, uh, you know, not a lot of, uh, I suppose, yeah, you know, perhaps 
is on the wrong path and the trajectory is negative, you don't have to invest there. There are plenty of other places to invest in the world. We've got most other markets in the world hitting record highs. We've got very strong, uh, you, you know, uh, like you look at the US labor market, incredibly strong. Uh, inflation not quite there, so, so maybe the Fed a little bit more benign, but a fantastic territory to go and invest in. You know, a lot of trouble around the UK at the moment with the concerns around Brexit again, uncertainty, you know, hampering new investment. But, but certainly there are plenty of uh, different uh, stocks that give you on low, listed locally without having to use a foreign uh, investment allowance that you can invest directly um, offshore via our local exchange. Again, this comes down to if you're not concerned about the systemic risk in the system, which I don't think you need to be. You, you're more saying, where am I going to get performance? Am I going to get performance locally or am I going to get performance outside, outside of the country? So there are plenty. So the one thing is you don't have to invest in recession. Now, the second thing is you don't have to invest in stocks which is also yeah, a very strange thing for me to say because I've been kind of selling stocks for the last decade. But um, there are plenty of other investment vehicles to look at. Now, you can look at, I mean, we, I mean again, so, so we've kind of given you a few examples. You can look at exchange-traded um, funds as well. You don't need to go and do complex, you know, you don't have to have a bond broker. I mean, you can go and buy something like the New Funds Gavi ETF bond, and it'll give you access to the bond market straight in your, your regular stockbroking portfolio, but it'll bring down your risk, and it'll give you a far more stable return as well. You can look at PREF shares. One of the things that we've been looking at for a lot of clients at the moment is structured products, which are very, very interesting uh, things. So I've just given you kind of a, a payoff here. So these are, these are products that you, we go to the banks, or the banks come to us, and they, they, they generate an idea uh, around a basket of products. So essentially what happens is, you, you know, in the case of the last one, so this is an actual um, one we did. They buy a bond for about, it's about 76% of your funds. As the bond then pays off over a five-year period, it gets you to a, a return of 5% over a five-year period. And that gives you a capital guarantee on your money. So if you're concerned that markets are going to fall, that, that, that the economy is not going to grow, that gives you a capital guarantee. You, you're not going to do worse. So in, in, in a situation, I always think of investing, there's always three possible roads. There's the thing collapses, the, you, you shoot the lights out, or you just muddle along and do nothing. So in the event that um, the markets collapse, that, you, that you're investing, so the territories that you're looking at collapse. In this case, no problem. No problem at all. You get a 5% return guaranteed. The, the second thing, so they take you, you've used up 76% of your money buying that bond. Use the rest of that to, to create an option structure where you can now almost pick the, the different territories that you want to invest in. So in the last one, I think it was 46% S&P 500. Um, it had a, a whole a range of, of Asian ETFs as well. And then it had a, a, the balance in, in, the Euro, in the Eurozone. So it was a truly global strategy. Now, what it's saying is, like, we then go and buy options on this, which gives you upside performance. So now, if the market ends positive, so you're not losing money, if the market ends positive, you, we, we actually structured it in a way that you'd get two times gearing on your money as well. Market, market goes up 10%, um, you're going to go up 20%. Market goes up 15%, you go up 30%. Uh, 30%. You go up 30, the market goes up 31 and a half, uh, 31, you know, did I do that wrong? Yeah, um, yeah, so 31 and a half percent, you go up 63 percent, and that's where you cap. Now, to afford the structure, we've got to sell, uh, we've got to write an option as well, so we've got to write a put. That helps us fund the structure for you, and, and you've got to think about investing. There's nothing, there's no free lunch, so in this case, you know, when you get to 63 percent up, we kind of draw a line in it and we say, okay, you can't, you can't have any more performance than 63%. And because we're selling away the further upside, we can afford to have the structure. So in this case, if I think of the three roads again, in the downside scenario, you do okay. The rest of the, everyone else that bought the market got hammered. You got your money back plus 5%. If the market muddles along, we've had an eight-year bull market. We're in a recession. Things are perhaps not looking uh, so good. If the market just muddles along and does anywhere in five years, 30, what, 31%, or well, I suppose actually 63% and under, you do either the same as the market or better than the market. So you outperform. And the only situation where you don't make exceptional gains is if the market shoots the lights out and does 80, 90%, you're only going to get your 63%. So when everyone else is like really rich, you're not going to be quite as rich. So we thought this is, I mean, this is a great product for, for recessionary investing. If you're concerned about uh, what's happening, these are the kind of products you do. I mean, this one we actually wrapped up and listed in Bermuda. It was, it was really, it was, it was fun. It was, a, it was a great product. And it's, it's something to consider that you can look outside your in a in, in recession, you can look outside the, the traditional instruments as well. We've also put derivatives to bring down exposure as well. So there are, there are options open to you that, um, 
these days. I mean, financial markets have become so complex and so uh, accessible as well that uh, no, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that you can do with it. Um, I suppose this brings me to the next point, which is, now, should you be doing that? Now, this is the, the real concern because, you know, I would say if you're an equity investor, if, if your strategy is to be a long-term equity holder, you want to buy a diversified portfolio of stocks, which, I mean, we know if you look at cash and bonds and property and all that, stocks are going to do the best if you've got a long time horizon. You will make more money in stocks than anything else. If you're jumping in and out, and I mean, I've had clients over the last however long that, that have always, it's always, I mean, even, even from 2008, the bottom of 2008, when we all, like, with hindsight, say, oh, we would have bought like it was going out of fashion. Back then, it used to be the double dip. Oh, no, 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 it's going to double dip. It's, it's going to be a, a W-shaped recovery, not a V-shaped recovery. You can't buy yet. Just wait for it to go up a little bit more. This is just a dead cat bounce. Then the first, like, 20% is gone. Then it's like, I don't know, okay, W shape, okay, we'll just wait a little bit longer, then the next 10, 15% is gone. Already you've lost sort of 30% just by not being in the market because at this stage you were going, oh, I better get out, I better go into bonds, I better go, you know, I better try and you know, de-risk my portfolio completely. I've seen more people, you know, even when we, we started getting towards the highs and people had taken like a two, three year run, you, you, you know, from say like 2011 to say 2013, maybe, you know, maybe 2012, People are coming and going, oh, we, we, we've had such a lot of upside. It, it's about time for a correction. Gary, don't you think that there's going to be a stock market collapse in the next six, six to 18 months? And you go, yeah, of course. I have no idea if there's going to be a collapse because if there's going to be a collapse, it's, it's going to be one of the unknown unknowns. I'm not, no one's going to know about it. It's going to happen. Everyone's going to panic and, and we're all going to sell. But, um, and what do they do? They jump out of the market because they're trying to be savvy investors, trying to time the market. The market goes up another 10, 20, 30 percent, and then they go, oh, I better get back in. And meanwhile, they've underperformed massively. So there's a lot to be said by just staying invested in the markets. To try and, to try and remember, equity markets and, and indices are leading indicators. So to try and look at the economy and go, oh, the South African economy is in such a bad place. I mustn't invest in the South African market. Doesn't make any sense. The South African market is already pricing in what's going to happen in the, 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 the fund underlying economy a couple of years ahead. It first happens in the financial markets. You know, when you know, we had Nenegate, how quickly did the currency move? It's instantaneous. Something changes, the financial market changes, the, the economic markets, so all the numbers that I showed you previously, those are all backward looking. Markets are already forward looking. So to try and predict markets, we've got to try and work out what's going to happen after markets. And unfortunately, you know, equity markets you can see a lot further than you. You know, the big professional investors, as much as like I want to be, come here and say, listen, these are the secrets to equity market investing. As retail investors, you're not going to have access to the information that, that is available to professional investors that will be able to beat you in, the, in this case. So what is your role? Where do you guys manage to, to, to grab value that, that other people can't? So one is definitely in the small and mid-cap space because there, there aren't people that are looking at these companies. But the second thing is you just buy quality and wait. These companies will go up. If you're buying quality at reasonable prices, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be the, the guy who's got the, the complex, you know, long short strategy on, on you know Nasbass's rump because you see ten cent being overvalued and, and the rest being undervalued. You don't need to make complex decisions. Go and buy things that, that are, are reasonably priced and, and and wait. And time is on your side. If you're in, you, you will do well. Um, so I've just got, given you a quick uh, stock survival checklist as well. So I think Simon will send around the um, the slides as well afterwards. But in a recession, so when, when times are tough, what do you look for in businesses? The, the real concern is that you go into, you know, especially if you're looking at small and mid-cap stocks, you go into something that goes out of business. Now, that, that is a concern. So for me, you, you look for survivability in the stock as well. So you look at uh, things with lower gearing uh, in, in difficult times because you want to make sure that it, it's, it's got the ability to, one, survive uh, the downturn, but two, be able to raise capital if they, they're deals. Because often when the markets are suppressed, you know, everything else becomes cheap around you. And if you've got the, the, a strong enough balance sheet, you can buy out other companies. You can, you, can, you can use this to grab market share. 
So you want companies with good cash flows. You also, in a recession, you don't have to pay. You know, when people, when the markets are subdued, you don't have to overpay for good quality. You know, I remember we used to look at the market and we all wanted the, the, the great quality stocks, but they were all on like 35, 40 PEs, you know? And we were like, oh, but it's such a good company and we really want to buy it. And we wait and you wait for a year, two years, you're looking at it and you're like, eventually, at what point do I just say, oh, I'll just buy it because I, I want to own this thing? Suddenly now you have the advantage that, that you can actually, these, these are reasonable companies. There's a significant margin to safety in buying at these levels. So look at its PE compared to history. You can look at all the different valuation metrics, but PE is probably the simplest to look at. Um, look at products that are, are, are diver, uh, diverse, and also look for companies that um, you know, are low-cost providers. Uh, look for companies that are substitute products, that, that are themselves offer, at least look for companies that offer substitute products. So when you have a high-priced product that everyone's buying, so think of like premium, some premium brand, I don't know. I don't really buy anything anymore because of the recession. <laughs> but, um, you think of like the fancy cars, you go for the, the, the less fancy cars now. And if you sell the, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind sort of like the, the Mr. Price value fashion kind of offering. Instead of going and paying for, you, you know, Hugo Boss stuff, you might go and shop at Mr. Price. I don't know. Um, also look for products that have inelastic demand. So, so here we're kind of going to go through the sectors as well, but consumer staples, um, you're looking at pharmaceuticals, services, you know, tax services, businesses, anything that, um, you know, continues to perform no matter, you know, you don't have to look at cyclical stocks is what I'm saying, but these are, these are the traditional, um, I suppose, recession-proof sectors. And I've given you kind of a list, which is the consumer staples, discount retailers. So the, the typical example is Walmart or offshore, but um, these days I don't think that's true because I think Amazon is going to destroy Walmart eventually with its uh, increased technology. But you, you're kind of looking for the, those kind of value offerings. You're looking at pharmaceuticals and healthcare as well. People get sick no matter what. People, people might not go and buy you know, their new fancy you know, upgrade of their car, but they, if they're sick, they're going to go to hospital. Um, interestingly, uh, sin stocks, so I, I forgot to put it in the presentation, but there was a wonderful, there's actually a psychological study that says when times are tough, people will not, they'll, they'll delay large purchases, but they will still make purchases of like those small creature comforts. And part of that is, um, is serviced by the sin stocks. It's, it's alcohol and tobacco. The one sin stock you, you, you must not look at, don't even consider, like as a recession-proof stock, I would say is uh, the gambling stocks, or Sun International, the likes of that. Because, um, you know, that's obviously, it's very dependent on, on, on the, the availability of discretionary spending. So, you can look at utilities, like I said, service companies as well. So what you're kind of trying to work out here, I suppose, is what I'm saying, is when, you, when you're looking for, for I suppose, the, the stocks that you want to select here, is you, you kind of want to find stocks that, um, you know, maybe in sectors, maybe not in sectors, but uh, you kind of want stocks that uh, are using the recession to increase market share and to, to enhance in, uh, efficiencies. Because what happens is when, when the business environment gets very, very difficult, that's when all those, uh, I suppose, little, you know, extras and little things that you didn't have to worry about suddenly become important because your bottom line is under pressure. So suddenly you, you, you see the businesses that start cutting costs out and they become a lot more uh, efficient. You know, as Warren Buffett says, you know, you, you know I, I was going to not give you a picture of Warren Buffett's face. I actually Googled, uh, you know, when the tide goes out, discover you're swimming naked. Not a good idea. Really not a good idea. The cartoons were just really pornographic. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, essentially, yeah, where this it allows you, like in a recession, it allows you to, to better identify good quality companies because you'll see the companies that are getting into trouble now and you're going to see which companies are grabbing market share. And that sort of brings me to the fifth point, which is okay, well, be a contrarian investor, but like that, um, so, so you know, this, this slide or this uh, picture always reminds me, there's uh, two guys and they're sort of sitting in the savannah and they're like walking along, or well, not sitting, they're walking along and then they, they come across a lion and the one guy like immediately goes down and starts tying his shoelaces and his friend looks at him and says, what are you tying your shoelaces for? You're never going to outrun the lion. He says, I don't need to outrun the lion, I just need to outrun you. And he, off he goes. So that's kind of what, you, what you're looking for in companies as well. When things get tough, you know, yeah, not all our, our retailers are going to go out of business and so on. Even like probably the, the sector under the most pressure here, mining sector, no question. I mean, look at look at the, the likes of Lonman. I mean, the, the the decimation of shareholder value has been exceptional. But not all of the platinum miners are going to go out of business. Some of them might. Lonman might be the one that does. But um, 
you know, some companies have to survive because goods and services have to be produced. They have to be there. And in a recession, it allows you to more easily identify which companies the, the, these will be. And at the same time, it's like everything's on sale. So you're going to get like a 40% discount on, on all these good companies. So if you've got time on your side, you, you go and find the companies that are grabbing market share. You find companies that are doing acquisitions. You find companies that the market is punishing unfairly. And you find companies that are still investing for the future. So remember those two pictures. You find companies that are still willing to invest in markets. And that's where you're going to find, that's where you're going to find the value. That's where I think you're going to see companies that, uh, in fi you know, and remember, equity is a three to five year investment proposition. This is not short term. I'm not talking about trading here. That's not, I mean, you can trade the noise and recession, but then we'll be talking about technicals and it's probably up to trade a peer tree to take you guys through that. But um, this is, yeah, it's a three to five year game. Use the opportunity now to, to buy things at, at, at a discount. Okay, so I've got some stock picks as well. I think we've still got time. Yeah, so we've got about 10 minutes for stock picks. And then we'll open the floor, I think, for 15 minutes. But uh, so I've, I've kind of left these as like really the, the typical recession-proof kind of stocks. Uh, we own all three of these stocks in, a, in our managed portfolios as well. Um, so the first one, I mean, this is really the, the, the stalwart in, in, in the industry. It's, it's one of the SIN stocks. It's, the, the one thing is it's not cheap, but, but British American tobacco is never cheap. It's never been cheap. I don't think, it, will it ever be cheap? It's cheaper than it was, a little bit. But, um, I mean, a fantastic dividend payer, you know, again, one of the things that you want to look for in a recession is, you know, what happened in the last recession? How did this uh, stock perform, uh, you know, in the past? I mean, you look at the dividend payout. This, is, this uh, orange line here is kind of the, the growth in, uh, in dividends per share from the company. You can see absolutely steady. I mean, it's got a 3% dividend yield, so it's a good dividend-paying stock. Um, it, and still agree, there's 2008 recession, increased its dividend from, from 66 cents per share to, to 84 cents per share. So, I mean, nice growth in dividend over a very, very difficult period. That's kind of the, the, the quality of a business that you want to, want to look at. What's it up to these days? Okay, very, very interesting. So, you know, one of the big risks, I suppose, around... Um, around buying a tobacco stock, like a, a huge tobacco stock, is that uh, growth is under pressure in the industry. One, it's because of healthcare trends. Like, obviously, everyone's getting healthier. Fewer and fewer people are smoking. But, um, you, you know, and that makes it very difficult to, to grow organically. There's, there's not going to be new tobacco companies. But uh, what it is doing is it's acquiring new businesses. So it's uh, just, uh, I think today we got the, the, the confirmation that, that the Reynolds deal will go through. That will make it the largest uh, tobacco company in the world. I think it's going to I think it's already producing one out of eight cigarettes globally. Um, and, you know, really, I mean, this, this business, what, what it essentially does, I mean, it, it's, its volumes can go backwards, but, but it's also, it, it's because of, I suppose, the addictive nature of its product and because of the technolo technological advances that it's bringing into, into the field, it actually manages to increase its margins repeatedly. So you actually see earnings going up while volumes are going down. While the volumes are going down, their cost base is actually getting lower as well. So it's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not a bad play. Um, I suppose, like the, the real, you know, for me, the catalyst around it is 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 the the, the new gener the next generation products at least. So next generation products are, you know, it's kind of all the the, the innovation in smoking. So I don't smoke personally, but it's the. It's the little like things that you pop in the filter, and it has menthol. It's the vape cigarettes where you like driving along, you suddenly see these giant clouds that are coming out of a car. That you think like, how can that much smoke be coming out of a car? It's all these these new generation products. Now, an interesting stat that I read earlier was that apparently 30% of vape smokers were non-smokers beforehand. So people that have never actually had a, a, a burning cigarette are smoking vape cigarettes, and it's a completely new delivery system for nicotine. Now. I mean, I always feel terrible buying <laughs> British American tobacco because it doesn't feel ethically right. But, but the fact is this, this company is making money. It's, it's growing. It's, it's been an incredibly uh, stable, uh, stable earner over time. And, and, and the numbers, unfortunately, speak for themselves. So you can kind of see this is, this is sales growth in, uh, of, of vape kind of uh, products. So that's the next generation product. I mean, you're seeing like France, like 100% grow, uh, at least uh, 300 and... Uh, Sorry, 100% growth in France. I must get my flags right here. 310% growth in Italy and 20% growth in Europe. So you see an enormous adoption of these next generation products. Um, and yeah, it's uh, also the, the other thing, the one thing, what do you want to know? You know, in, in, a, in a very saturated environment, you want to make sure that the company that you're buying is also grabbing market share. 
Um, so this is kind of a list of their, their major markets that they operate in. So I think there's 36 markets there at the moment. They're growing in well over half of them. They, they, they're taking market share. I think about two-thirds of them, they, they're actually uh, grabbing market share from, from other tobacco suppliers. You can kind of see that the stock price kind of tells its own story. Um, you know, it gets sometimes it gets expensive, sometimes it's a little bit cheaper. Um, but over time, it's a very stable uh, player as well. So this is kind of like in a recession, that's kind of what you want. You want to try and drop the market risk on your portfolio. That's one of the things that we're doing today. So you want something, you know, this is not, you don't have to chuck all your money into British American Tobacco, but it, it can form like almost that stable unit in your portfolio. Um, you know, whether you should be buying up here, I think, you know, you probably want to try and buy down at that lower trend line. I think it's about, what, it's a 8, 840 is the 200-day moving average, which sits there. So you can look for a little bit of a pullback, but again, no hurry. It's, it's not a, you know, this is not a go out and buy this immediately tomorrow, but certainly, certainly on, a, on a pullback, I would probably be accumulating like BAT here. Um, you can see, so, so obviously it listed in our market, uh, I think 2008, but, this, but it's obviously been around a lot longer than that because it was listed in London. So this is actually the, the London listing of the stock as well. And you can kind of see that just takes it all the way back to 1997. And you can kind of see the stability of, of the, the earning, uh, of, of the share price growth here. Now remember, this is just the, the, the share price. That's not even a total returns chart. I mean, it's a dividend paying stock as well. So, I mean, you compare, you know, you compare its performance uh, versus the, the JSE All Share of the last five years, British American Tobacco up 103% versus the market, which is only up 57%. So, and I suppose that's my other point that I wanted to make, is that investing in a recession is not about trying to lose as little money as possible. I mean, and that's kind of like when you go to the big fund managers and you give them a whole bunch of money and you say, you guys are clever, I'm going to pay you 4% fees or whatever you, whatever what most people seem to be doing these days. When they underperform, they go, oh, but don't worry, I outperform my benchmark. <laughs> you know, it's fine. You, know, you might have lost 20% of your money, but you know, the market went down 25. Now, that for me is not what recession investing is about. It's not about finding a spot for you to lose as little money as possible. It's about finding businesses that can actually grow and do well and, you know, that you might be buying. You're buying the quality businesses in a recession because they suddenly are affordable to you. Uh, whereas in the past, they were always too expensive. That's kind of where, where I'm looking for it. Like I said, British American Tobacco, you know, because it's a multinational, probably hasn't come down. I think the South African recession hasn't influenced it. But if the globe goes into a recession, maybe that's the time to buy it. But, but for me, again, trying to time the markets is sometimes a silly thing to do, and you should probably just own it immediately. Okay, so the second, uh, yeah, so the second uh, recession-proof stock that I've uh, I've picked is Mediclinic, which, uh, yeah, which is an interesting one. So again, so this sort of fits into the the healthcare um, uh, sector. Uh, again, it's it's been it's been absolutely crushed after the old, old new transaction that it did, um, and that has brought I mean it's brought the share price down dramatically. But uh, there's a lot going on in the company that I think the market's not quite recognizing at the moment. So, I mean, Mediclinic, you know, about 50% of its revenue comes from Switzerland. Um, it's the only listed vehicle that you can access Swiss healthcare. So hospital beds, if you want to invest in Swiss, Swiss hospitals, you cannot do it other than via Mediclinic. Why do you want to invest in Swiss hospitals? Switzerland has an aging population, and they've got plenty of money for private healthcare, and Mediclinic doesn't mind charging high margins either. So it's, it's a fantastic territory it's operating in, and it's entrenched in there already. There were some regulatory issues. It was one of the reasons the share price came down. Those are now through, and the regulation is not going ahead. We expect the, the market to kick the stock price up on the back of that. The market's very, very subdued. We don't know why, but for me, it seems like an opportunity. The second thing is the big growth. And I mean, you can kind of see the growth numbers here as well. So, um, you know, South, South Africa is still, still a, a, a fairly significant portion. I mean, 30% of the business. Um, but uh, in revenue terms, but uh, the big opportunity for them really is the, the UAE and, and, and the Emirates. It's a very fast growing uh, environment. They've gone in there, they did obviously the El Nur transaction to get a foothold. Huge amount of problems that they discovered when they, they went in. Speaking to management, they've come back and said, yes, they probably would have done the deal at a slightly lower price if they, if, they, if they had known everything that they had known. But they definitely still would have done the deal. Because the fact is it gives them a foothold in a very exciting and, and, and rapidly expanding market. 
One of the problems with the, with the UAE was the, the Tika co-payment system, which was uh, reversed, which basically meant that uh, everyone in the UAE had to pay for healthcare, or they had to pay 20% of healthcare. But healthcare there is also like having massages, and, and it's not quite like healthcare like we imagine it. Um, and that, that has now also been reversed. So that issue has also been removed from the company. One of the reasons the share price got knocked has now no longer affected, share price still hasn't recovered. The third issue, in the, well, the third issue that, that was affecting the stock price was the, um, was the uh, also in the UAE, was uh, just the, the quality of the doctors and the way that the doctors were being remunerated. Um, it was a big problem. They've now cleaned that out. So management has fired, basically gotten rid of a, a lot of the, the, the doctors and rehired under better packages and, and managed it to, to fill, uh, I suppose, a shortfall in doctors as well. Um, that for us also, you know, challenge management, it, it seems like the, 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 the worst is out. The guidance on this company uh, to the sell side is very, very conservative at the moment, which is probably the reason that you're seeing the share price uh, a little bit suppressed. It's, um, you know, and, and sort of chatting to, to like, I mean, we, we, we've got, like, kind of the guys, uh, you know, sell side analysts that will go and chat to the company at length and, and know the thing intimately. They are of the opinion that the management is being a lot, uh, being far too conservative, potentially because of the what happened in the El Nur transaction. They, they, they are, they, like, the sense is that we're getting is that they're under-promising and they're going to over-deliver. When they over-deliver, you could see a very quick re-rating of the share price as well. Um, other catalysts could be there's, there's still rumors going on. They also own a stake in a company called Spire in the UK. Um, they they look they, they might be be going for a full takeover there. A couple of days ago there was there was rumors on the wire feeds that that uh, was going to go through. So Spire, which we actually own in some of our UK portfolios as well, um, shares there spiked on that. It's like three four percent on that. So so there's definitely there, there is movement in those shares, and it does look like they're going to go ahead with that transaction, but nothing on the cards yet. So it's kind of that's the whispers floating around the market on Medi Clinic. Um, obviously a short price history on Medi Clinic because it used to be MDC, and this is uh, pulling MEI data feeds, but um, you can see a huge, huge share price correction. Um, that was the reporting, great results. Under-promised, over-delivered. Very good results, quickly you know, you know, fell off again, but no, no, no real fundamental news flow around that. So still, um, yeah, we're still very comfortable to hold MediClinic and, and, and we'll be buying more at these levels, uh, looking for a significant re-rating as, as the, the earnings start to come through and they manage to right-size the businesses. Okay, the last stock pick. Okay, so this one. Okay, so it's the reason that we've, we've kind of picked it as a recession stock um, is because, you know, Steinoff these days is not a South African retailer. Okay, so one for South Africans, it gives you nice offshore exposure. But as we saw, the 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 U.S. you know went into 2008. You know, printed a whole lot of money and quickly recovered. The EU, because of like the, the austerity and, and that, took a little bit longer to recover. So their, their uh, I suppose, r you know, return to their recovery has been a lot uh, more protracted. And you can see that kind of in the numbers earlier in the slides. Um, now, what we have seen is Germany is doing fantastically well, but the, the rest is now starting to come on steam. Um, Steinhoff is also not expensive, but it's going to take advantage of, 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 a, of a wealthier European consumer. It's a discount retailer as well, so, so that kind of ticks another box as a recession stock. A lot of its, its stuff yeah, is discount retail, but as the European consumer recovers, um, Steinhoff uh, is going to make a lot of money. It's, uh, it's going to be able to increase uh, margins nicely. Um, and as you can see, so, so Europe and UK make up still about half the business. Africa is still important. There's also rumors, of course, of spinning off the African assets. Now, that is, you know, I've got the numbers written down in my pocket, but I, if I remember right, currently the market, you know, looking at the share price of style, the market is pricing it, you know, if it had to create retail Africa or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we, we kind of understand the appetite is there. The market is, is, is valuing that at about $42 uh, billion, dollars, uh, 42 billion rand at the moment. Um, if you look at uh, kind of the estimates of if you were to actually unbundle it and, and separate so that you had a, 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 stein -off, a true Steinoff International and, and an African Steinoff, you would probably unlock close to 40 billion rands worth of value. So there is a, a serious discount on the, on, the, on the local assets. Why is there a discount on the local assets? Because everyone is pessimistic about South Africa. Everyone is pessimistic about Africa in general, I think, at the moment. But um, it's, it's, you know, that's this kind of like, you know, when, when you're looking at, uh, I suppose, building an investment case, you, 
You're looking to, to find assets that are marked down. You're looking for those, those companies that are at a discount that over time, you know, whatever the catalyst might be, the catalyst might be an unbundling, but the catalyst might just be the market recognizes that these, these businesses are worth a lot more than, than they're currently being assigned. And, and you get the, the, the big fund managers starting to buy it and you get a re-rating in the share price. Um, yeah, very, very diverse revenue streams as well. Um, one of the other issues around the company that's kind of kept the performance back a little bit was everyone, they, they're thinking that uh, Steinhoff has overpaid for Mattress Firm. Um, I don't think that that's the case. So, so you kind of look at Mattress Firm's listed share price and you know, the thing collapsed and then they paid more than the record high for it. So you, you, you can kind of look at that and think, okay, maybe they did overpay for it. But, but really, it, it gives them a foothold in the US um, and, and they're doing what they do best. Sign off management is, 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 is second to none. They go in there, they, they, they you know, rip out the, the, the old inefficient models, they put in new ones, they, they use their vertically integrated business model to you know, improve the logistics and the supply chains, and they suddenly take businesses that look pretty shoddy and they make them into really good quality businesses. Um, another acquisition is Poundland. I mean, I lived in the UK for a long time, so I remember Poundland. It was that like really crummy store that you know, everything costs a pound and you walk in, but you don't kind of want to buy anything even though it is a pound, you know? Um, they'll go in there, they'll, they'll, they'll revamp it, and we can see that because look at what they did for Conferama, which was very much the same story. Conferama mar uh, margins improving, stores uh, you know, much more profitable than they were, and really working the style of magic on them. I suppose the question for us is we want to try and get the, the Conferama margins to about 7.5%, and, and then we'll be kind of happy that that's, that, that business turnaround is, is good. But this is, this is kind of Steinhoff's business model. I mean, they, they go, they buy businesses. The, the Steinhoff that you buy today is not going to be the Steinhoff that you have in six months' time because there's probably going to be a whole lot of deals. But this is kind of what you're paying for. You're paying for management expertise, and you're paying for very clever people to go in there, you know, buy underperforming businesses and, 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 and manage them correctly and uh, create a lot of value for shareholders. And for me, that's, uh, that's a business that you should hold. And uh, that's a, the kind of thing that you want to buy in a recession. You want a management team that, that is working for you, that's going to go out and it's going to buy, buy underperforming businesses that are probably going to get into trouble. And they're going to turn them around so that when the world gets a little bit better, they are in the pound seat. Um, also, sign off. You know, a little bit. The share price has come off uh, quite substantially. I've kind of discussed the reasons for that. That was the, uh, like I said, mattress firm. A little bit of concerns there. A little bit of concerns about overpaying. But uh, really, you know, for us, still, still a, a very good quality business, probably being marked down a little bit unfairly, and worth buying. That's uh, my presentation for this evening, which 